Welcome to the video. My name is Pushpinder Gill and this is going to be my email address where you can send me a valuable feedback. So today this is the video about data sufficiency and this is the first video and this is just the introduction of the video, right, of, of the topic, right? So I won't be doing some tough questions here. However, this is very crucial if you're seeing data sufficiency questions for the first time for you to understand the premise, the structure of a data sufficiency question because uh, leave the question aside, the structure itself a little bit complex that makes our life a little bit more difficult. So let's go ahead and start with this. First of all, why is data sufficiency important? Now data sufficiency comes in tests like GMAT. Okay, it comes in test GMAT, doesn't come in GRE, doesn't come in HCT. It comes mostly in GMAT and it covers 40 to 60 percent of the quantitative section. So you can very well uh, think how much important is it for you to go ahead and start your practice on data sufficiency if you're planning to give your GMAT test because if you don't know about don't practice too much data sufficiency and you sit in your GMAT test believe me you're gonna get a very low score as you have expected so let's see that this is a typical data sufficiency question I'm, I'm not going to solve it I'm just showing it to you okay this this over here is your question okay and this over here is your statement one and this over here is your statement two now cutting it short you're supposed to give you're supposed to tell the author that which of the statement is able to tell me the value of X is it the first statement alone is it the second statement alone or do I have to combine both the statements to give you the answer so this this is the premise of it so let's understand it in detail okay so if I break it if I if I give you the skeleton of the question this over here is a universal fact this is gonna remain true throughout the question okay if I say if I over here I say okay X is positive or X is greater than zero that means X will remain positive in all the statements okay now this is fact statement one now whatever is given here is gonna remain when true when you consider this statement so let's suppose you, uh, over here it says okay x is greater than 4 so when you're considering this statement x will always be greater than 4 however x greater than 0 will always apply here Hi, and this is a fact statement too so if you say okay x is less than 6 this is gonna remain true for only fact statement too so if you're looking at, okay, I say, okay, what is the value of X? I ask you, what is the value of X? I say X is positive. First fact statement says, and I say, okay, X is an integer as well to make your life easy, okay? So I say, okay, fact statement one, X is greater than four. So X can be five, six, seven, eight, I don't know. X is less than six. X can be one, two, three, four, five, six. And if I combine both the statements, I'm able to use this both fact statements and say, okay, X is greater than four, but less than six and an integer. That means X has to be equal to five. Okay, so this is how you solve a data sufficiency question. I've given you the simplest of the questions so that you understand it. Okay, now let's understand it even in more, even more better. If you understand the premise of a data sufficiency question, believe me, the toughest of the toughest question can be solved very easily. This I'm going to show you in the further videos as well. So all the data sufficiency questions have the same answer choices. So all the answer choices are going to remain same. They're not going to change. Okay, then three questions in one question how you have to look at the first statement first then you have to look at the second statement and try to solve it then you have to look at the both the statements and try to solve it so one data sufficiency question may be like a three question in one question so you have to be careful in that but the advantage is that the advantage is that you don't have to solve them if I say okay is X positive and if you're able to make out that X is positive fine move ahead so you don't have to solve the question throughout and find the accurate answer you just have to tell okay this statement is sufficient that's it end of story you they won't be giving you marks for solving the question throughout okay then what do the answer choices mean now let us understand what does each answer choice mean before we go ahead and start solving some questions because it's pr because in the end answer choices matter because this is where uh, one of the one of the five answer choices is our answer and we need to understand what does all the answer choices mean so let's see at this question 
what is x? x is equal to 16. The first statement says, okay, x is equal to 16. Are you able to make out the question, um, get the value of x from the first statement? Yes, I can. And the second statement, I'll confuse you and make you believe that I know the value of x, but in reality, I don't know. So the second statement would be like, okay, x squared plus 6x, something like that. It will make it make you believe that it can give you the value of x. However, it won't be giving you a value of x. So whenever the first statement only gives you the answer and the second statement does not give you the answer, your answer option is A. So what does A mean? Statement 1 alone is sufficient, but statement 2 is not sufficient to answer the question. So this is the meaning of first statement. Now let's look at the meaning of the second statement. Same thing, just that first statement will not be able to give you the answer alone. However, second statement will be giving you the answer and this is the their answer choice is B here. That means statement 2 alone is sufficient, but statement 1 alone is not sufficient to answer the question. Okay. So this is what statement B means, answer choice B means. Okay, now this is about answer choice C, wherein you combine both the statements. Now since this question is asking, where is X? He says, first statement says, I saw him, saw him going out with Y's sister. Second, Y had just talked with his sister and she's in the mall downtown with some guy. So that means you know X is Y X is in mall downtown because first statement tells that X is with Y sister, second statement tells that that Y sister is in mall downtown. So that means I'm able to get the location of X using both the statements. So which is nothing but your answer choice C. That both statements taken together are sufficient to answer the question, but neither statement alone is sufficient. So this is what the answer choice C means. Okay? Alright. Now let's talk about answer choice D. So if you can clearly make out of this question that what can I buy from my salary? The first statement say okay one peanut. Alright. Second statement three less than four peanut. Again one peanut. So the both the statements are individually able to give me the answer. That means that my answer is D. So D statement says that D would be the answer if each statement alone is sufficient to give me the answer. So the first statement is giving me the answer and second statement is giving me the answer. So if both the statements are able to give me the answer, that means D is my answer. Okay, so let's move forward. Okay, so let's see this. Now he's asking in the question, do you love candy? First of all, the first statement is not giving me the answer. It's telling about I like watching movies with my girlfriend candy. So that doesn't mean that he loves candy or not. Second, I got beaten yesterday. Okay, all right. It doesn't give me even give me the answer. Even if I combine both, it doesn't give me the answer. So if the first statement doesn't give you the answer, second does not give you the answer, combining both does not give you the answer, your answer option would be A. Okay, so we have done all of them. We have done A, B, C, D, and E. A means first gives you the answer, and second does not. B means first does not give you the answer, but second does. C means first individually doesn't, second individually doesn't, but if you combine both, it gives you the answer. D means first statement also gives you the answer, and second statement also gives you the answer. On the other side, E means first does not give, second does not give, and both does not give you the answer. So this is the meaning of the data sufficiency answer option. So I hope you understood this and will be able to apply all these things into your data sufficiency questions. Okay, now let's understand what you should be doing. A basic, very basic approach, even given in your GMAT official guide, it's a very basic approach how you should do a data sufficiency question. So this is a typical question of data sufficiency. What is the value of X and all that and all that. However, you'll be able to solve this question pretty easily. Now, why I have placed this question over here so that you understand what to do every time in a data sufficiency question. So, what do you do? When you read the question, what do you do first? You look at the statement 1. So, first of all, you should look at the statement 1. Or you can even look at the statement 2 as well. That doesn't matter. You should be looking at the statement which looks more easy. So, let's start with looking at statement 1. All right, what is the value of x? Okay, x plus y is equal to 2. So what can happen when you try to get your answer from the statement 1? It can either be sufficient or it can be insufficient. That's the only two cases. Let's talk about being sufficient. So let's suppose if the statement 1 is sufficient, what do you do? 
you look at statement 2. So, you look at statement 1 and let's suppose it's sufficient then you look at statement 2. Now, if you've looked at statement 1 and it is sufficient, can you tell me what all answer cho choices are eliminated or are disproven? See, if statement 1 is sufficient, E can't be the answer. If statement 1 alone is sufficient, C can't be the answer. If statement 1 alone is sufficient, B can't be the answer. That means your answer will lie. Let me just get a new pin. That means your answer is going to lie between a and D, that's it. So, if you're falling short of time and you have just like one minute left and you want to do this data sufficiency question because you know in GMAT you can't leave the questions alone. So that means if you look at the first statement and it's sufficient, you don't want to look at the second statement A or D, that's your answer. So, so what happens when you look at statement 2? Okay, so it can either turn out to be sufficient or it can either turn out to be insufficient. Okay, so let's suppose your statement 1 is sufficient, we have established that, and statement 2 is sufficient, that means your answer is D. Your statement 1 is sufficient, statement 2 is insufficient, your answer is A. Okay, so that pretty much explains the flow chart of this. So first you look at this first statement, if it turns out to be sufficient, that means your answer is either A or D. Then you look at the second statement, then it turns out to be either sufficient or insufficient. That means again, your answer is D when both are sufficient and answer is A when only A is sufficient. Now let's talk about the insufficient part. Let's suppose you look at statement 1 and it turns out to be insufficient. So, if your answer choices A, D are here, your answer choice left here is B, C and E, right? So, if you know that if statement 1 turns out to be insufficient, you got only three answer choices left. So, let's suppose your statement 1 turns out to be insufficient and your answer choices is B, C, E, then what do you do? You look at the second statement. Now, again, it can either be sufficient or it can either be insufficient. So, if statement 1 is insufficient and statement 2 2 is sufficient, that means your answer is B. If your statement 1 is insufficient, statement 2 is insufficient, then what do you do? You try to combine both of them. Then what happens? It can either turn out to be sufficient or they can either turn out to be insufficient. So your answer is C, if both are sufficient, giving you the answer, and your answer is E, then even, even both are not giving you the answer. So this is the basic flow chart of a data sufficiency question. You can very well start with statement 2, but your all the flow chart would change you. I suppose you can make this flow chart on your own as well. So let me just revise all of that that I did. You look at statement 1, it can either be sufficient or it can either be insufficient. So if it's sufficient, your answer cho choices are between A and D. If it's insufficient, your answer choices are between B, C and E. Then you look at the statement 2. So if statement 1 is sufficient, statement 2 is sufficient, your answer is D. Statement 1 is sufficient, statement 2 is insufficient, your answer is A. Statement 1 is insufficient, statement 2 is sufficient, answer is B. Statement 1 is insufficient, statement 2 is insufficient, you try to combine both the statements. Then again, if you if you're able to get the answer while combining both of them, your answer is C. If you're not able to get the answer by combining both of them, your answer is E. So this is the basic premise of a data sufficiency question. Now let's try to apply that in our questions as well. So it's n nothing, you, you have to do this question this way only. So he's asking, what is the value of x? Now he's already told, x is positive. Now this is a universal fact which will tr remain in both of these fact statements. So let's look at the statement 1. So if I see, okay, now this seems to me a quadratic equation. If I try to split the middle term, I say, okay, x square uh, plus 3x minus 2x minus 6 gives me 0. I think that's enough. If I say take x to be common, x plus 3 and minus 2 to be common, then again x plus 3 then it again gives me 0. So that means x plus 3 into x minus 2 is equal to 0. So that means x can be equal to either negative 3 or x can be equal to either positive 2. Now I've got two answers but hold on the universal fact says that x is positive. That means I can very well eliminate this. That means my answer is 2. So the first statement is giving me the answer. 
So what happens when first statement gives you the answer? My answer is either A or D. So I just need to check this statement. If it turns out to be sufficient, that means that uh, D is going to be my answer. And if it turns out to be insufficient, that means that A is going to be my answer. OK, let me go ahead and check the second statement. All right, now this over here, if I try to split the middle term again, x squared minus 2x minus 3x plus 6 is equal to 0. Mind my handwriting, guys. So x into x minus 2 minus 3, if I take common, again x minus 2. Then my two factors are x minus 2 and x minus 3. That means x is equal to 2 or x is equal to 3. Now, is this sufficient, guys? No, it's not because it's giving me two answers. X can, this will hold true for two values of x. So that means my statement 1 is sufficient and statement 2 is not sufficient. That means my answer is A. So why I'm doing this such an easy question is so that you understand the premise of a data sufficiency question. So over here, let me revise that. We looked at the first statement. It turned out to be sufficient. We looked at the second statement. It was not sufficient. Now you have to always take care of the universal fact. Sometimes we only look at the second state, first statement alone and try to get the answer. Sometimes some of the facts are given in the question, the universal facts, which are going to change the way you should look at your statements. So this is you know, one type of data sufficiency question. So let's see this question. So how many burgers did Chelsea eat? Chelsea ate X burgers. So we look at the first statement. Is it giving us the answer? No, it's not. Chelsea ate X burgers. I don't know what's the value of X is. So as soon as I get the first statement to be insufficient, I write B, C, or E. That means my answer is either from B or from C or from E. OK, let's look at the second statement now. If Chelsea ate 50% more burgers than what she had she would have eaten more burgers. So let me assume that Chelsea ate C burgers. If Chelsea would have ate 50% more burgers, that means if Chelsea would have ate 1.5 C burgers, then she had the then more burgers than what she had, she would have eaten 10 more burgers. That means she would have eaten whatever she ate plus 10 more burgers. Now hold on, you should not be solving this. Is, is this going to give you the answer? Yes, it will. That means my statement 2 is sufficient. So if statement 1 is insufficient, statement 2 is, ins statement two is sufficient. That means these both are eliminated and my answer is B. So you see how easy the question becomes. So you can solve it pretty easily. You just have to follow a structured way. Okay. So let's look at the next answer question. So what is the average of A, B, and C? So See, you should write always what the question is telling you about. So he's asking me the average of A, B, and C. So what I need is, I need to know what is the value of this thing here. So first of all, he's saying the value of A and B is 10. So I know A plus B upon 2 is equal to 10. This is what it's telling me about. Is it sufficient? No, it's not, because I don't know the value of C. So as soon as I know this, I should be writing B, C, and E. Then, he's giving me the value of C from the second statement. Now, hold on. Don't look at the first statement now. Just look at the second statement. Is the value of C alone will be telling you uh, the average of A, B, and C? No, it will not be. So, you eliminate B. That means statement 2 alone is not sufficient. Now, try to combine both. So, don't make that rookie mistake of automatically combining both the statements and then checking the answer. Over here, we got lucky. So, that second statement alone was not sufficient. What if the second statement alone can be sufficient? So you should be following the structural way. Looking at the first statement first, looking at the second statement alone, then combining. You should not be combining both the statements until and unless you have disproven each of the statement is alone insufficient. So now if I combine both, yes, I know A plus B is 20 and C is equal to 20. That means I can easily calculate their average. So see, I'm not calculating stuff here because I'm not wasting time while calculating. So you know, I know the value of A and B, I know the value of C. I can calculate the average of A, B, and C. So my answer is C because I'm able to combine both the statements and get the answer. Okay, so I hope this uh, helps you. Okay, let's look at the statement. How many goals did Dempsey score for London Football Club this season? 
So let's look at the first statement. He scored 25 goals this season. That gives me the answer, right? So first gives me the answer. Answer can be A or answer can be D. Okay? All right. Now he says that if he would have scored 40% more goals, let me say he scored X goals. If he would have scored 40% more goals, that is 1.4X. If not able to understand why I did 1.4X, watch the percentage video. Then he would have scored 35 goals. So 1.4X is equal to 35 goals. So does that give me the answer? Yes, it does, pretty much. So that means I'll be able to get the value of x, the number of goals he scored. So statement 1 alone is sufficient and statement 2 alone is sufficient. That means my answer option is D. Right? So I, I hope you understood uh, that statement 1 alone is sufficient and statement 2 alone is sufficient. That means my answer option is D. D is David. Okay. Now let's look at this statement. What is the average of A, B and C? Okay, so he wants us to find what is the value of a plus b plus c by 3. So what does the first statement tell us? First statement just tells us a plus b upon 2 is equal to 10. Does that give me the answer? No, it doesn't. That means my answer choices is not a. That means I should be writing b, c or e. Okay, because first statement is not sufficient. Let's look at the second statement alone. b plus c upon 2 is equal to 20. Does that give me the answer? No, it doesn't. So I should be striking off B. Now let me go ahead and combine both the statements. So from here I know the value of A plus B. From here I know the value of B plus C. I've got two equations but three variables. So can I find the answer? Even if you try algebraically, you won't be able to find the answer. That means my answer is option E. So you understood the premise of a data sufficiency question. That's my main objective of this video. Not tough questions, just the premise. Look at the first statement first, then look at the second statement, then combine both the statements. So this should be the structure. You should not be combining both the statements before looking at the statements alone. Okay. So now let me tell you a very important point to remember. Very important point. Okay. Ans if the answer is D, then both the options will give the same answer. This is true for all the GMAT questions. So I don't know about others, but all the GMAT questions will give you this. So if the answer option is D, then both the options will give the same answer. Look at this. How many score? How many goals did Dempsey score here? 25. How many goals did Dem Dempsey score here? 1.4x is equal to 35. That means x is equal to 35 into 10 by 14 so even if I say okay 7 times 2 and 7 times 5 2 times 5 and 2 times 5 that gives me 25 so I'm getting 25 answer here I'm getting 25 answer here this is a very nice way of checking that okay my answer is right so both the statements will give you the exact same answer if the answer choice is D so this makes gives you a tool of checking your answer. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm giving my answer as D and well, I'm, whether I'm right or not. Or on the other hand, you should always look for proving that, okay, my answer option should be D. That means if 25 holds true here, 25 should hold true here as well. That should all, that gives you another tool of solving data sufficiency question. So this is a very important tool, very, less revealed by anyone on the internet so you should be really making this useful okay so the tool is that if the answer or if the answer is D then the both the options will give you the same answer okay if the answer option is A then the one of them is not sufficient that doesn't make any sense okay so the answer option is D then the both options will give you the same answer so keep in keep this point in mind while solving the data sufficiency questions because this will help you a lot especially in the tough questions 700 to 800 level questions so what are different types of data sufficiency questions now this is very very crucial so if you don't understand the types of data sufficiency question you will not be able to use the strategies which i'm going to show you in the in the further videos you know in a very good manner because all the tough data sufficiency questions can be solved very easily if you know the types of data sufficiency questions and the strategies to solve them. So there are two types of data sufficiency question. First is one answer question. So he is asking you how many goals did Dempsey score? There is only one answer to that, right? He scored 25 goals. That's the answer. 
If he says he scores more than 20 goals, so I don't know what the answer is. So these are one answer questions or simple questions, simple data sufficiency questions, wherein you just have to find one answer. Second, two answer questions. Now he is asking, is X positive? Now does that give you the answer? Yeah, that pretty much tells me that X is positive. Now what does this, this option tell me? This option tells me that X is going to be negative always. Is that the answer? Yes, this is the answer because he is able to tell me that yes, X is not positive. So these kind of questions have two answers, a yes answer and a no answer. So these kind of questions are the most trickiest, most tricky questions in the GMAT data sufficiency and we have a very good strategy for that. I'll, I'll tell you in the further videos. So there are two answers to this question. So let's suppose if I ask your name, is your name David? So you'll say, okay, um, no, my, my name is not David. That, th you're giving me an answer, right? Okay, yes, my name is David. Then again, you're giving me an answer. So that means there are two types of data sufficiency question. First is when you have one answer, a specific answer. Second is when you have two answers, a yes and a no, okay? So thank you very much for watching this video. So the next video would be we'll be discussing the types of data sufficiency in details, the strategies that you should follow and we'll be solving some pretty tough questions on it. So this is my email address. Send me your valuable feedback and uh, thank you very much and see you next video.